Good morning, church. I love that one of our values is pray first because I love uh, for anyone who is preaching how often they get prayed for. Um, not just because it's something to receive, but it's a, it's a good, humble reminder that it's not about who is preaching. Um, it's about God's word. Um, and so I'm grateful that we're a church that prays first, and I'm grateful um, that I get prayed for. Um, and we make that a, um, a priority um, every time. I don't want that to go against me. Um, so yeah, I'm so excited to preach through our Hebrew series this morning. We're going to continue in Hebrews chapter 12. Um, we're going to skip ahead a little bit. We're going to be in verses 12 through 17. Um, we're going to actually come back on Father's Day and we're going to go through Hebrews 12, 3 through 11 because it really um, talks about God the Father, it talks about him, um, how we can look to him as the perfect father. And so I'm excited for that on Father's Day. Um, and as, uh, as our value is pray first, one of the things we're going to do at the end of our service is we're going to pray for our students as they go to camp tomorrow. So they're, gonna, they're actually serving in OBC Kids today, which is an amazing thing. Um, that they do every first Sunday, but we're going to pray over them before they leave um, tomorrow um, because next Sunday is going to be Student Takeover Sunday, which I'm so excited for. That's where our students lead worship. That's where they'll do offering. They'll do welcome. Um, we're going to hear testimonies. We're going to hear from um, Don. The, um, and it's just going to be an amazing thing that we'll do next Sunday. And we'll pray for them at the end of the service today. So I'm excited for that. We're going to be in Hebrews 12. 12 through 17. I'm going to read this and we're going to jump right into it because there's a lot to get through and it's real good. It says this, therefore strengthen your tired hands and weakened knees and make, make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but healed instead. Pursue peace with everyone and holiness without it no one will see the Lord. Make sure that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springs up, causing trouble and defiling many. And make sure that there isn't any immoral or irreverent person like Esau who sold his birthright in exchange for a single meal. For you know that later, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, even though he sought it with tears, because he didn't find any opportunity for repentance. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. I thank you for this church, Lord. I thank you for the truths that we sang um, this morning, or just straight gospel, um, and so good for my soul, and a reminder that there's no righteousness outside of you, Jesus, and what an amazing thing that your blood has purchased salvation for me, um, and as First Peter does say, Lord, um, you call us to holiness, but also you purchased the ability for us to be more holy with your blood as well, so we praise you for the gospel. Lord, I pray that as we look at this today, we would be encouraged as we look to heaven, as we look beyond today, and Lord, that we would be um, encouraged to be your people, your sheep, your saints, your church, Lord, and that you would equip us and help us to know uh, that serving you um, is, the, is the only real option when we understand what you've done for us, willingly becoming a slave to obedience because we want to. Um, we get to do this, Lord. So I pray, Lord, that you would speak through your word today and convict us. Um, I pray for anyone here who doesn't know you, Lord, that you would save and draw people to yourself, Lord, and that we would be more like you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, like a lot of Hebrews, in a lot of sections, verse 12 starts with therefore. And therefore means we need to pay attention to what we've looked at. And as we started Hebrews, the whole premise of it was Jesus is better. Jesus is better than everything that came before. Jesus is the perfect revelation of God the Father. And that needs to be in our minds as we read this, but this therefore is really talking about the beginning of verse 12 and even um, verse or, or chapter 11. And last week, Pastor Dustin finished chapter 11, which is the hall of faith. Concluding with the last two verses in the beginning of chapter 12, it says this, therefore, since we have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What an amazing passage. 
Therefore, so therefore we have this great cloud of witnesses. We have all these people who by faith obeyed God, who God used their lives to fulfill his plans. They got to live incredible adventures, all glorifying God by faith. And then also, therefore, we're to lay aside all the hindrances that slow us down and all the sins that slow us down that we're told to get rid of because we have a race to run. Looking to Jesus, who not only pioneered our faith, an amazing thing that the gospel uh, was planned before God created us, that he pioneered our faith and that he is perfecting our faith. He's perfecting us and sanctifying us until one day when we meet him in heaven, we won't deal with sin. We won't have um, bodies that are in decay. We will be made perfect and completely righteous, but we are seen as righteous because of the blood of Jesus. In chapter 12, we'll look at this on Father's Day, but it does talk about God in his love. He disciplines his children because he loves us, because it's for our good, because it will lead us to holiness and it tells us it'll yield peace, a peaceful fruit of righteousness. It also says that we will endure hostility. We will struggle against sin. We will go through trials and tribulations. But first of all, we look to Jesus because we're following him. He went and walked through all of those things before we did. He endured hostility. He died at the hands of sinners. He was tempted in every way. We are yet without sin. And for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. That's one of my favorite verses. For the joy that laid before him, Jesus went to the cross for me and for you and for anyone who put their faith in him. So therefore, because of all of those amazing things, we move forward. Therefore, strengthen your tired hands and weakened knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but healed, instant, or healed instead. So like a lot of Hebrews, it points us back to the Old Testament. And we've tried to encourage you whenever you see something from the Old Testament, go back and read it. So we're gonna do that. This, these verses are found in Isaiah chapter 35 and we're gonna end up reading that. It's only 10 verses, but the first four verses say this, the wilderness and the dry land will be glad. The desert will rejoice and blossom like a wildflower. It will blossom abundantly and will also rejoice with joy and singing the glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of God, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the weak hands, steady the shaking knees. Say to the cowardly, be strong, do not fear. Here is your God, vengeance is coming, God's retribution is coming, he will save you. So this passage of tired hands and weakened knees comes from this prophecy in the book of Isaiah. And I love this in verse 12, strengthen your tired hands and weakened knees. It's, it's kind of an illustration of looking forward or sometimes we say this thing like you get a second wind or you decide to go on is what it is talking about here. Um, you decide to keep going and it's this illustration. I like running and if you've ever run a race, there's plenty of people in here who've run marathons. I've never done that, but I've run half marathons. And there's a point in the race, you run faster than you've trained but there's a point where you have to decide, I'm not going to stop because your body is yelling at you. Stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. This is not fun. This hurts over and over and over. About mile 10 or 11, when you, you're just turning and you know the finish line is near is when your body is yelling at you the loudest. Or when you go hiking and you can see the peak or you know it's up there and your quads are on fire and you have to decide, I'm gonna still go, I'm gonna still go. We're gonna make it to the top of this. Or if you're a student, I remember like elementary school was the worst. Like fifth grade, I remember when it would be like after lunch, like one o'clock, those last two hours were the longest hours of my life. For some reason, it's just, but you had to decide three o'clock's coming, three o'clock's coming. You had to decide that, hey, we're staying in this and you can't go anywhere, like you're in school, you can't leave. Or in work, we all have monotonous projects or if you've had like a job, like college jobs are always full of these monotonous things where you just have to tell yourself like just a little bit longer, just a little bit longer. Um, I worked at Delta for a while and it was literally in the summer heat, like you're getting a taste of it in May, but come August, you would literally just lose 10 pounds of sweat being on the ramp, throwing bags in the bottom of an airplane. And I'm huge, I don't fit in these things, but it was a college job, it was great. But you had to tell yourself, this plane's gonna, this is the last plane of the day. This is the last one. And God is calling us 
in this passage to decide to keep going, a call to perseverance, a call to say and decide even before it gets that hard, I'm going to keep going. Verse 13, and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but healed instead. And make straight paths for your feet. When I read this, it says, yeah, we start with a decision that we're gonna keep going, but it's also proactive. It takes preparation to make straight paths for your feet. I'm gonna read this quote from uh, John Calvin that uh, talks about this in a really good way. It says, this straightness of the way which he recommends is preserved when a man's mind is superior to every fear and regards only what God approves. For fear is ever very ingenious in finding out byways. As then we seek circuitous courses when entangled by sinful fear. So on the other hand, everyone who has prepared himself to endure evils goes on in a straight way. Whosoever the Lord calls him and turns not either to the right hand or to the left. What he's saying there is we're all going to face trials and hardship in our life. And what it tells us is that our natural course of action when we're afraid is we're really good at finding a way out, right? We're called to straight paths for our feet, to make a decision to make straight paths for your feet because when you're scared, you're like, oh, I'm going to go this way. Or, you know, when you run a race, you're like, well, I already ran 10 miles. Like, what's the last three? I'm still proud of myself. And you start playing these things in your mind of how you can get out of the situation that you're in. Which a lot of times leads to sin because sin tells us like, hey, like just, just come over here. It'll, it'll ease the pain. You deserve this. Like you deserve this way out. It's really hard. You push, you push through. And sin lies to us. And it gives us an easy way out. That is not the way that we're told to live our life. So the question I can ask is what are your byways? It's really important, even as Socrates says, know thyself. It's very important for us to know ourselves and to take inventory of things. When I am stressed, I. When I am anxious, I do this. When I am put down for my faith, I do this. When I endure hardship, when I am tempted in this way, when the Holy Spirit convicts me or when I'm scared, fill in the blank of what do you run to or what do you naturally want to do when those hardships come, because they are. This is promising it. The Bible is very clear that if you are a Christian, it's gonna get hard, not the other way around. So what are our byways? What do you naturally run to when fear shows up, when you're afraid of what to do? And we need to be prepared. Just like yesterday, our family went to the beach and we had to prepare to go to the beach. In order to go with two kids is already kind of not a good idea because my daughter's one and my son is three and it's just a sandy mess. But you know, we bring towels, we bring sunscreen, we bring water, we bring food for them just to like survive the time. And I love my daughter because she doesn't like to get nasty and sandy and so she likes to hang out with me because I like that as well. And Chrissy and CJ are just digging and burying themselves in the sand and are totally fine with it. They're like sand. Who knows? It's not even here. But we prepare for things. We prepare for college. We prepare for retirement. We prepare for the weekend. God is calling us to prepare for discipline from him. He's calling us to prepare for hardship, calling us to prepare for temptation, to prepare for trials. Because the Christian life requires endurance. We are running a race. It requires endurance. And what does that look like? That does... That's like deciding what you're going to do in advance of these hard and difficult things, knowing that they're coming. And for temptation and things, we need to set up guardrails of knowing, okay, I'm going to put these things in place because I know I have a proclivity to this or I'm tempted by this. And deciding in advance, when I am stressed, I will stop and pray. When I'm angry, I'll walk into another room. When I endure hardship, I will stop and I will thank the Lord for everything he's given me. When I'm tempted, I will ask the Holy Spirit to help me and provide a way out. When I'm afraid, I will trust in God. Whatever that looks like, if there's a verse you cling on to, if there's something, if you know something about yourself in advance, prepare for what you're gonna do in the moment to seek holiness and not to indulge your flesh. And that's a moment by moment decision. 
for all of us. It takes moment by moment decisions to look beyond current circumstances, to look to the future, to look to the finish line of our race, to look to the top of the mountain, and we look to heaven. Isaiah 35 goes on to say this, in five through 10, it says, then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will sing for joy. For water will gush in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The parched ground will become a pool in the thirsty land springs. In the haunt of jackals in their lairs, there will be grass, reeds, and papyrus. A road will be there and a way. It will be called the holy way. The unclean will not travel on it, but it will be for the one who walks the path. Fools will not wander on it. There will be no lion there and no vicious beast will go up on it. They will not be found there, but the redeemed will walk on it. And the ransom of the Lord will return and come to Zion with singing crowned with unending joy. Joy and gladness will overtake them and sorrow and sighing will flee. Praise the Lord. <laughs> we can go home now. Um, but that's the straight path. That's where it leads. That's what it offers. And we need to make sure we're constantly when life hits us or when our flesh or our desires or our selfishness or our pride come, we want to get off of that road. We want to be like, ah, it's too hard. That looks like, that looks like water over there. I'm going to go that way. We have to know ourselves and we have to know what God promises. Joy, redemption, singing and praising and the lame will walk. Verse 13 goes on and says, and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but healed instead. When hardship comes, when discipline from God comes, when trials come, we can choose to resist or we can be healed. That's what this is telling us the, the offering is. It will be hard, but you make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not get worse, may not become dislocated, but it could be healed. To resist in trials will only make things worse, but God offers healing. He offers fruit. He offers sanctification. Whenever you read anything in the Bible that talks about trials, uh, we're told to count it all joy, James says. Peter tells us, like, don't be surprised when this comes. It is producing righteousness in us. Sometimes God will give you the hardest thing in your life to save you from yourself yep. and sin, to bring healing, to rip out whatever's in you that is keeping you from the person he has called you to be. And that is the grace of God. And it looks like it's hardship, but that's discipline. Discipline is not punishment. Discipline is proactively trying to straighten out the path. I discipline my children because I want what's best for them. Not because I want a perfect acting kid. No, I want them to love Jesus. I want them to grow into the people that God has them designed to be. And that requires guardrails and discipline, and it requires truth, and it requires some confrontation of getting them. But ultimately, this takes faith, trusting God completely in those hard moments, trusting God before we get to the hard moments that when they come, they're for our good, for his glory. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, I love this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not rely on your own understanding or your own byways. In all your ways, know him, and he will make your path straight. So how do we stay on this road? We look to Jesus. He will make our path straight. Verse 14 says, pursue peace with everyone and holiness. Without it, no one will see the Lord. So that first word pursue, again, is proactive. Pursue or chase, hunt, follow. Those are all making a decision to go after that thing. Pursue peace with everyone and holiness. First one it says to pursue is peace. Peace is not easy. Peace involves being selfless. Peace is not passive either. Anyone who has a best friend or a spouse knows what it takes to have peace with one another. It takes humility, it takes love, it takes forgiveness, it takes confession, it takes confrontation, it takes humility to be at peace with one another. Peace does not pa mean passively just letting everything slide. That's not peace. That's passivity. We're called to peace and we're called to holiness. Because friendship with the wicked is not to be allowed to pollute or dilute us. 
calls us to peace and holiness. And I, I love that these go hand in hand. We're called to pursue peace with everyone, but we're also called to holiness. And whenever either of those is out of whack or only one we're focusing on and not the other, we're missing the mark. We're called to peace and holiness. So am I saying don't have unsaved friends and be holy? Not at all. And we're gonna look to Jesus. Jesus was called a friend of sinners, right? Jesus said, I came to hang out with the lost people because good people don't need a doctor. But Jesus was on mission with those friends in pursuit of peace and holiness for their souls. That's what he was on mission for, peace for their souls while also maintaining the holiness of his, right? Jesus was also perfectly confrontational. Most of us like, man, we, we love to say like, God is love. Jesus was a friend of all these people. He would never like, he was accepting of everybody. That's not, when I read my Bible, like they didn't kill him for no reason. Jesus wasn't just like a nice guy with a good teaching, no. Like Jesus was perfectly confrontational. In love, shaking people up to try to get them to see that they needed saving and redemption. Like Jesus got into arguments with the Pharisees because they were so just in their Bible, they couldn't see that he was God. They couldn't see that they needed saving. They were so good that they didn't need any help. And Jesus confronted them to try to get peace with everyone, but perfectly in holiness. And like discipline, God disciplines us because he wants us to be producing holiness in us. Full of grace and truth was Jesus. Perfectly peace and holiness. And that's what he's calling us to. Peace and love, being on mission for the kingdom of God, not just for the sake of it. So I think a couple ways I, all of us can miss the mark on these. The Bible warns them about them or warns us about them. James 4, 4 says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? So whoever wants to be the friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. So that's a warning where we're out of whack, where our pursuit of peace and friendship is not matched up with holiness because if you're using peace with everyone to still hang out with a crowd that is diluting and polluting your holiness or to not address sin in someone you claim to love, then we need to repent of that because that's, that's peace with everyone and that's not holiness, that's not on mission. And on the other side of that, we have Mark 2, 17. When Jesus heard, them, heard this, he told them, it's not those who are well who need a doctor, but those who are sick. I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. So if you're using holiness as an excuse to not engage with sinners or continues, pursue peace with everyone and holiness because without it, no one will see the Lord. And what this is talking about, again, is not works. Hebrews has made that complete, completely clear. Back in chapter 10, verse 14, it says, for by one offering, he has perfected those who are sanctified. So we are holy and righteous because of Jesus. I'm not holy and righteous because I did X, Y, and Z today. I'm seen as holy, but I'm called also, as a Christian, there is a holy living that is an expectation that comes along with our salvation. And verse 15 shows us an example of pursuing both peace and holiness at the same time. It says, make sure that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springs up, causing trouble and defiling many. So make sure, again, is proactive. That means see to it or take care or search diligently, look diligently to make sure that no one falls short of this grace. And again, Hebrews is full of warnings. It's full of warnings and then truth and application, but then it goes back to warnings. So it warned us in chapter two that we can drift away and we have to watch out. It warns us in chapters, chapter three and chapters five and six, it warns us about drifting away and paying attention. In chapter 10, it says that that's why we must stir one another up to love and good works and not neglect to meet together because we need it, because drifting away is a possibility for all of us. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. That song makes me cry every time because of that, because it's true and we all know it. We are prone to wander. 
We are seeking these byways that are easy. We're warned first to watch out for ourselves. And then we're also now warned to watch out for one another because we need it. I need it. I need encouragement. I need compassion. And sometimes I need a good spiritual kick in the pants. Yeah, like, and that's why we need each other. I submit to my pastor and sometimes he calls me out for stuff because I need it. In the same way we do that, that's why we're here. We need to stir each other up to love and good works because we're prone to wander. We're warned against drifting away that many times in one book for a reason. Verse 15 goes on, it says, make sure that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springs up, causing trouble and defiling many. This is urgent. This is, hey, make sure, see to it. There's an urgency to it. And if we're not pursuing peace and reconciliation with our brothers and sisters, then it tells us that will take root and grow into bitterness. If we're saying, no, I'm not gonna seek peace with that person, it, it turns into bitterness. And guess what happens when you're bitter against a fellow believer? You can't do what it just told us. How can you watch out for the spiritual health of someone else if you're bitter toward them? You're actually probably rooting against them without actually saying it out loud. Bitterness never makes good on its promise. And it's so hard when we're in a bitter season, it feels so good because you're like, you're mentally fighting this person, right? Like you're mentally like, yeah, like I got the upper hand right now and it feels good while you're in it. But then everyone knows when you're out of it, when forgiveness and restoration has come to, you're like, man, that was the worst. Like, it never makes good on its promise. This Greek word here, it, when it says it, it defiles many, that Greek word is used for like dyeing a garment, like taking a white shirt and like dyeing it purple. It was not intended to be purple. It was intended to be white. And that's clearly seen to everyone. So. Everyone knows what it's like to be around a bitter person. They might think they're hiding it, but it's, you can see it. They're like, when I'm bitter, I'm cranky, I'm irritable, I'm not fun to be around, I'm like on guard all the time. And you think no one can see it, but it says it defiles us, meaning we look different than we're supposed to. And again, if we're bitter, we're opposing God's design, which is there shouldn't be bitterness because you need to watch out for one another. Not because don't be bitter because it's a rule. No, everything in the Bible is not just rules for the sake of like God making rules. Everything is for a purpose, for our good. And bitterness will eat us alive. It prevents us from obeying God. It works against peace and holiness and it causes trouble. Everyone knows that like it causes trouble is what it says. We all know it does that. So what do we do with these weeds and roots of bitterness? Rip them out. Like, stop messing with them. Rip them out. Kill it with Roundup, whatever you do with weeds. Light them on fire. Just don't mess with it. It's just not the design of the garden that we're supposed to be nurturing. We're supposed to pursue peace and holiness, watch out for one another, and make sure that bitterness is dealt with because, again, urgency. We don't have time for that. We really don't. Verse 16. And make sure there isn't any immoral or irreverent person like Esau who sold his birthright in exchange for a single meal. So Esau, back in Genesis, he's the firstborn of Isaac. He's the grandson of Abraham. Jacob was his brother, they were twins. Jacob comes out holding his heel, which is why Jacob is called the deceiver. Jacob was very deceptive. And we talked about him in this series before. Um, Jacob was a mess. He was conniving, he was always scheming, especially against his brother, and that was just until God literally wrestled him into submission, this is the path that he was choosing. But one day Esau was exhausted. He was a manual laborer. He liked to go out and work hard. And one day he was so exhausted, Jacob decided to say, hey, I'll trade you, uh, trade you some stew for your birthright. And Esau was like, whatever, I'm gonna die anyway, do it. And it says that he was immoral and irreverent for a reason. But Esau, we see when we read him and look at this, he was a slave to his passions and desires. He was a slave to the moment. He was a slave to, yeah, like I'm exhausted right now. Who cares about tomorrow? 
He was a slave to his passions and desires. He was immoral. It tells us that from this, other translations say this is sexual immorality. He was sexually immoral, choosing pleasure over God's commands. And we, we know this because his parents specifically, they told the boys, hey, we're not to take wives from the Canaanite women. So what did Esau do? He got two against his parents' wishes. And it says in scripture that it made life bitter for his parents. And he did it on purpose because he didn't care. And it says it was, he was irreverent. We look at this the way he gave away his birthright. He didn't care about the promise that God made to Abraham, his grandfather. He didn't care for the plans and things of God. He was unholy. Irreverent just means the opposite of holiness. Like you, have, you do not have reverence. He did not care about God. And that's why he was immoral and irreverent. So make sure there isn't any of that in us. 17, for you know that later when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, even though he sought it with tears because he didn't find any opportunity for repentance. Scripture is clear that anyone at any time that you are alive can repent and turn to Jesus and you will be saved. That's not what this is talking about here when it talks about there was no opportunity for repentance. So if you're in here today and you think God can't save me, I'm too far gone, you are still breathing. There's still opportunity for repentance and salvation because the blood of Jesus is stronger than us. This was not the repentance of Esau. Here, when it says, even though he sought it through tears, what this is talking about, he was sad. His brother ended up stealing his blessing too. And with the birthright and the blessing comes the financial inheritance to the firstborn. That's what Esau was sad about. He was like, man, can we undo this? Like, I really want the land and the cows and the money and the servants and all the things. He was sad about missing out on the financial blessing. He didn't care about Isaac. He didn't care about the Abraham's promise that God gave him. He was hardened against God because he was living for the passions of today instead of thinking about tomorrow. He was a slave to that. And scripture tells us that we are a slave to what we obey. So we can be slaves to sin or we can be slaves to obedience that leads to righteousness because of Jesus. So as we close here, I wanna go through these points that the scripture has told us. Has told us. And then I'm gonna read some scripture over us. But it, church, make sure and watch out for sins that are causing drifting towards unholiness like Esau, because we can drift toward that. Make sure we watch out for one another. Make sure and watch out for roots of bitterness. And if you have them, rip them out and get that dealt with. Seek peace with everyone. And again, it's not easy. It's not just a sorry, okay. Like you might need to have a hard conversation with someone but seeking peace and holiness. What's crazy is what I just said about Esau, like we, the Bible says like he didn't care about the things of God, but you know what? He got the bitterness thing right. He might've messed up every other thing, but Genesis 33 tells us that when Jacob was coming back, it says Esau ran to meet him, hugged him, threw his arms around him and kissed him, then they wept. Jacob stole everything from Esau. And he, he expected, he sent his family in two camps because like if, you know, if my kids, if one camp gets destroyed, I still got the other ones. Like he thought Esau was gonna kill all of them. And Esau knew that bitterness would eat him alive and he forgave Jacob. He was immoral and irreverent, but he got that right. We're to pursue peace and holiness. And Christians, we're to strengthen our tired hands and weakened knees. We're to make straight paths for our feet. We are to decide in advance and to prepare in advance for the hardship that will come, knowing and telling ourselves, this is what we're gonna do in this time. Will we fail? Absolutely. But the grace and mercy of Jesus is more. We prepare first by looking to Jesus. We must prepare for these things. So I'm gonna ask you to stand and I'm gonna read this First Peter passage over you before we have a time of response. Before we sing. Let me read this, 1 Peter 1, 13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. We prepare for these things by setting our hope fully on the grace of God in Christ. And we can pursue holiness because Jesus literally ransomed us from the futile ways. Jesus bought the ability for us to be sanctified and to be more like him with his blood. What an amazing truth of the gospel. Not only are we saved and we get eternity with God in heaven, but the idea that we can be holier tomorrow than we are today was bought by Jesus' blood. So we must prepare our minds for action by looking at that truth every single day, preparing for action. I'm gonna pray for us and then we're gonna sing. If you wanna know more about Jesus, there's people down here who would love to pray with you. I can do that. Um, or if you just need to repent or uh, ask God for help with bitterness, whatever it might be, there will be a time where we can respond. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for reminding me this week as I studied um, that there's just no place for bitterness or for sin because it just gets in the way of the mission, plain and simple. It's a hindrance. And Lord, help us to cast off these sins that we mess with because they do so much more harm than good. They get in the way of your kingdom. So Lord, I pray for our church that you would strengthen our weak knees and our hands because we're tired. Help us to have our eyes fixed on you, on eternity in heaven with you on redemption where there is no more decaying anything. Lord, we'll have perfect bodies. We'll be righteous and we'll be full of joy. As we read in Isaiah, that's what you promise us is joy in your presence. So Lord, help us to choose you over anything this world offers because it never holds up its end of the bargain. So help us to choose holiness and to love you. In Jesus' name, amen.